Tonight we're in Dumfries, and welcome to Question Time. And with us here tonight, the Conservative peer, former Secretary of State for Scotland, a passionate advocate of both the Union and of Brexit, Michael Forsyth, a close ally and admirer of Jeremy Corbyn in the Shadow Cabinet until two weeks ago, a former bricklayer, the Labour MP, Chris Williamson, a speaking up for culture and tourism in Scotland, we have the SNP's Culture Secretary, Fiona Hislop, the co-convener of the Scottish Greens, whose MSPs prop up the SNP government at Holyrood, Maggie Chapman, and the journalist and broadcaster, former chief political commentator for the Daily Telegraph, now writing for the Daily Mail, Peter O'Bourne. Uh, let's take our first question. It comes from Gail Murray, please. Gail. Do you agree that Theresa May was correct to slap Boris Johnson down for wanting more money for the NHS? Boris Johnson, who famously today, uh, this week, I mean, said he was going to ask for 100 million a week in Cabinet, and the Prime Minister appeared to get everybody else to gang up on him, uh, and he never actually asked for it in the end. Michael Forsyth. Well, I don't think he was slapped down for asking for more money for the NHS. I think he was slapped down for saying he was going to say that in Cabinet when discussions in Cabinet are supposed to be kept private and where people have an opportunity to air their views. Uh, but I actually think Boris was right. I mean, the whole Vote Leave campaign was based on the fact that we contribute a net contribution of £10 billion a year to Europe. The other £10 billion we're told how to spend. Uh, and that uh, a large slice of that money, if we were outside the European Union, should be spent on the health service. Uh, and, uh, and I think he's right about that. And I think one of the oddities about the present cabinet uh, is, I mean, we've got it tonight. We've got the Chancellor of the Exchequer appearing to say something that's completely at odds with what the Prime Minister said in her Lancaster House speech. So I think Theresa May needs to get a grip on uh, the cabinet and the cabinet need to get behind her because we are about the nation's business on this Brexit matter. And it's essential that we all pull together, and that means across parties as well, in order to get the best opportunity for us to uh, benefit from being able to determine our own laws, our own borders, and to decide how we spend our money according to our own national needs. Thank you. Chris Williamson. Well, the National Health Service is in absolute crisis. So let's remember that Boris Johnson promised us £350 million a week for the National Health Service. Where has that gone? But, you know, there is a major problem in relation to a number of aspects of the National Health Service too. The internal market that was originally created by the Conservatives, I think, back in the late 1980s, is currently costing in the order of £10 billion a year. So we obviously need to reform the National Health Service. We need to get rid of that internal market, in my opinion. We need to properly resource the National Health Service. And Labour has promised to fund the National Health Service to the tune of uh, £30 billion extra over the life of the next parliament because we can't go on with this crisis that the National Health Service is confronted what with. What did you make moment. of what was going on in the Cabinet this week? In terms of the... the questioner who said, was Theresa May correct to slap down Boris well, Johnson? Cl well, clearly, no. What was going on, in your view? You're... Well, there's a power struggle going on within the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party is riven between the Brexiteers and those that, uh, that oppose that and want to remain inside the European Union. But, you know, Theresa May is struggling to uh, negotiate with her own cabinet, let alone negotiate with the EU. And uh, Boris Johnson going off peace like this is an indication of the crisis that the Conservative Party is in at the moment. And there's all sorts of rumours now that she will be facing a leadership challenge before very long. But let's not lose sight of the fact that the health service is in crisis. And when the Tories say that the uh, never been better prepared for the winter crisis, well, I just ask them to look around and see the ambulances queuing up. You notice how quickly he's up. trying to change the subject. Well, no the fact is, Labour is a shambles on Brexit. It doesn't, it's facing every direction. No, 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 no. You didn't even Absolutely. try and answer the lady's question. You, the first thing you did was Absolutely change the subject to the National Health Service. Absolutely. 
Uh, so Labour wants so to leave the, the problem for the European Union. It was a join it. It was a part of the Peter. system. Uh, but, Peter, yeah. the point, but the point wasn't Lady asked about the National Health Service. The fact is that Boris Johnson has talked about extra money for the National Health Service. And he wants it completely consistent, brilliantly consistent. He campaigned well, on that well, basis well, hold on. when we campaigned Where's for Brexit. Where's the consistency, Peter, between £100 million a, a week, the, which he's offering now, and the £350 million that he was telling us during the uh, referendum campaign? The £350 million. <laughs> All right, there we go. Maggie, Maggie Jackman. Quite frankly, it's difficult to take anything the Conservatives say about the Nat National Health Service seriously. It's almost impossible... <laughs> it's impossible to run a health service in a sick society. And our society is sick because our economic system is set up to channel money from the very from the poor and, and normal people to the uh, very very wealthy that that that's at the cause of this and i think it's also quite rich for michael to sit here and say that actually everything will be fine under brexit because of this tories immigration policies we cannot attract the nursing students that used to come to us from the european union and because and because of of the the, the quite quite meaning quite meaningless um, limits set on, on um, what, what people can earn. We can't attract junior doctors from around the world because they won't actually earn enough to meet the minimum income requirements. OK, I, I, actually... All right, let me... Let me I didn't, uh, th th Fiona Hislop, um, sp speaking for the SNP, what's your view of what happened in Cabinet and of the state of politics at Westminster? Well, I think there's two aspects to the question. One is, should there be more money in the health service? And of course, in Scotland, the health service is devolved and the Scottish Government runs that. We have a budget next week and there is more money for the health service there and we challenge the Labour Party to support that budget. But your question, I think, was also about the politics of this within the Cabinet. I think we have an attention-seeking Foreign Secretary who wants desperately to be sacked. <laughs> OK, just on that point on, on the health service, you might want to just explain why, if we take uh, from 2012 to 2016, expenditure on the NHS in England went up by 10%, but in Scotland it only went up by 5%. Because, why was that? Because we have, re we have regularly increased investment in the health service. Since the Scottish Government came to power, investment in the health service has gone up £4 billion to £13 billion, and just in this... Uh, this town alone, Dumfries, there's just been a brand new got, hospital opened under, worth £256 million. And the health service in Scotland, by any regard, is far more resilient and is okay. not going the privatisation you've got, route you've got, that you're seeing in the rest okay, of the got, Remember, you've sorry. Got, yeah, you've, right got, you've got... You've got 20% more per head because of the money that comes from England under the Barnet formula, and you spend that money... It comes from our taxpayers! It comes from our taxpayers! And you spent that money, which, was, which came from the increase in the expenditure on the health service, on other things. So hang on a second. Isn't there a bit of um, kettle and pot here? Because didn't you Almost support certainly. the 350 million a week coming in if bus, everybody would yes, Brexit? 350 million a week is what our gross contribution is to the, health, uh, to the yeah. uh, EU. If I give you, if I give you £10... Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, 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 £10. Now, uh, you give me 20 Certainly you give me not. 20. And by, the way, <laughs> and by the way, I'm going to tell you how to spend that £10. Yes. That is the deal which we have with the European and, Union. And, and Mark Carney has said that the 0.9% <laughs> GDP depression that we've got in our growth and the problems that's causing just now is worth £350 million. All right, let me go to members of the audience. Now. Uh, uh, you said you in the blue. Blue. Uh, I'll come so to you. Far, hasn't you, in, you in the blue there. Um, I'm a, a GP here in Dumfries. I, You're like a GP? To, I'm a GP, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd like to know what the, the uh, Scottish Government is going to do about the uh, lack of consultants in Scotland. There are 430 uh, consultant positions that are unfilled in Scotland at the moment. And in the local hospital, the current vacancy is 24 consultants are missing. Uh, that's a percentage of 24%. That's unprecedented. So you don't think it's any big deal what's going on? What do you think, sir? You don't, I don't think you, what do you say? Yes, you point. Yeah, if part of the question is about slapping Boris down for asking the question yes. about where's the money coming for the health service, given the fact that we've talked about being in crisis and there being unprecedented demand, when is the time to talk about it? And you think this is the good time? 
Uh, absolutely. Yeah, he's, he's being told there's a co cabinet collective are saying, do not talk about this now. It's a debate for later. But clearly, the pressures are, are they're imminent. They're now okay. debate later P isn't going to solve a problem that we P have today. Peter Roman, you're a political commentator. What do you make of what's going on? I mean, you spoke briefly, but what do you think's going on in, in cabinet between May and Johnson and Philip Hammond saying he's the foreign secretary and all that? I think that, by the way, I completely agree with what the gentleman just said there, but I. <laughs> I thought it was a very serious point, but I actually, I do think we, we are at a very, very grave moment in the history of this government, and I hadn't understood how grave it was until the events of today. And we do clear, clearly have a massive clash, and we've needed it, maybe, about the shape of what Brexit is going to be like. Clearly, Mr, Mr Hammond, um, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, uh, and the Civil Service are very, very strongly wanting Britain to basically to stay in the, the European Union in various major significant ways. Uh, and against that, Mr Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, and allies is arguing that if we leave Europe, we have got to leave it. We can't be, remain part of it, subject to his, its rules, but having no say on how those rules exist. Now, this has blared up, glared up today into a major, major row. And it reminds me a little bit, I have to say, of Heseltine versus Thatcher in 1986, a major clash between the two, the Prime Minister and one of the great figures of her government. And so I don't think we should underestimate... And how is it going to be resolved? Well, I think... Well, we're it's going to be resolved by uh, doing what the Prime Minister set out in her speech at Lancaster House, which is returning to us the ability to decide our own laws, decide how we spend our money, and decide on who we allow to come into our country. One of the reasons that there's enormous pressure on the health service is because under Labour, they lost control of immigration. Our population went up by more than 2 million. You cannot put your population up by 2 million and not expect pressure on our roads, on our schools and on our hospitals. Well, and we need to be able to control our borders yeah. and decide but what just our own laws on are. Point, no, but to pick up on the point... <laughs> I, I'll, come to you just, I'll come to you in a second, but Peter says that the Cabinet... This is a major turning point. The Cabinet has divided. Do you see a divided cabinet? Do you think Philip Hammond is going to be able to come to an agreement with Boris Johnson and the Prime Minister on the way Brexit goes? Well, I think that the cabinet have got to reach a collective view and they have to support the Prime Minister, which the vast majority of Tory MPs right. do. And if people don't agree with the policy of the Prime Minister, then they leave and they resign. What they don't do is remain in the cabinet and go off briefing and making speeches which give ambiguity and which undermine our national interest, oh. our national interest, right. because of our negotiating Does position. Does that so who, show who are how weak she is as Prime Minister, though? Uh, who are your candidates for resignation, then? Well, whoever is not actually going to get in behind what we stood for election in our manifesto to do, which was to leave the single market, to leave the customs union, which, by the way, discriminates against the poorest countries in the world and makes our food and our clothing... All right, we don't need to go food, through the well, policy again. We know the policies. Michael, well, I mean, you've just alleged that the problems of the National Health Service are to do with the previous Labour government. But when Labour left office in 2010, satisfaction in the National Health Service had never been higher. And we, on average, invested £5 billion extra into the National Health Service, £5 billion more than the Conservative Party. The on, problem on the of the National PFI. Health Service is the lack of investment from this government. That's where the uh, fault is. All right, the woman in the third point. row. They're going off in two directions at once. The, uh, the woman in, in black and white there, yes. I, I work for the NHS, have done for nearly 30 years, and I think that our MPs who represent us need to stop trying to outdo each other and need to actually have some honest discussions. I think they also well, like need, to, they need to stop discussing everything around Brexit. We have day-to-day -day business we need to manage. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you, what, what do you think about Brexit? It should take a back seat or it should be that the other things are more important than Brexit? I think you can't forget the day-to-day -day policies, the likes of what's happening in the NHS and the crisis that we're in in the NHS at the moment. There are workers across the country who are doing their absolute utmost to provide a service okay. that our, our public has expected from us for years. Fiona, do you and think, that's been forgotten at Fiona, times. do you think government is being 
is being misled by the Brexit argument and ignoring other things they should be concentrating on? Uh, certainly in Scotland, our, our main focus has to be and has been on, on the public services, on, on health and education. On health, we've had, uh, as you'll know, if you're working in the health service, an unprecedented winter in recent history. Um, and I think we all have to thank everybody that's helped. I've had personal relatives that have been uh, in the health service uh, over the recent, uh, recent weeks. And I think in terms of the challenges we have, yes, we've got challenges. We're investing more than ever before. We've got 12,000 more folk working but in Scotland about Brexit? in the health service. She I'm was saying that it. Brexit well, has taken over in Westminster. Because, because Clearly you have in the immediate, Holyrood, you don't have a direct well, have control the, over Brexit, you the, so you can't. Well, we have it. Well, there are issues around Brexit that are currently being discussed in the Scottish Parliament, which is about precisely making sure that we do have a say in what happens in Brexit, particularly around our devolved okay. areas. You and, said inspector yeah. there. Yes. And I just and I want to make the link because I think it's absolutely right we've got to do the day-to-day -day job and that's what we're doing and we're doing it against with a lot of pressures and everybody's trying to do it very very well. Okay. But the link the link with Brexit is just about how much money will be available for our health service in the future. And only last week the Scottish government which is the only one to have produced an economic analysis said if there's a hard Brexit there'll be a 9% at least reduction of GDP and that's the future tax take that will fund our health right, service. Thank you very much. And that's where the link Thank is. Thank you. Man in spectacles there. That there's a link between Brexit and the National Health Service and the, and, and the difficulties they're having finding future funding. Why is it that instead of playing political football with these issues, the parties don't get together in a coalition of expertise? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I just uh, I very briefly ask the politicians here what, why that isn't possible, because it's often raised in question time, but a kind of yes and no. Could there be well, cross-party agreement without I, going into Labour policy and Tory okay, policy? Well, no, no. Is there any meeting point that you could... I, I think the difficulty you? is there is, a, there is a, an ideological divide, sadly, between the parties. And the problem is that for, for far too long, and to be honest with you, this, this, this affected new Labour as well, that public services were seen as a cash cow for the private sector. And this is why it led to the, you know, the Carillion disaster. And what we need to do is to stop that. And I've already mentioned the, the, the issue about the internal market. We need to be investing in our public services. Public services should be exclusively about delivering public service yeah, but to the, the public, do you think not generating no, private profit so Chris, for the private sector. Right. 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 Yeah. Do you believe... Do you, believe, do you believe there's merit in the argument? Look, I, I agree entirely with what the gentleman says. There clearly is a crisis this winter, in the, and the, with terrible stories are coming from the hospitals. And I think there's going to have to be a great deal more spent on the National Health Service. Now, I think you're right. The parties must come together. They have to agree. And I think the time has come for a royal commission of all three parties, or four, five, four or five parties, to... Uh, to, 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 come, to go into these great issues, right. because actually... Won't that just delay, delay solutions? Not at all, because if you look at the history of the National Health Service, it's been an amazing success. Look at the history of Royal Commissions, on the other hand. <laughs> no, they, what they do, though, is they, 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 they may be long drawn out, but they bring about political consent. You know, the, the Beveridge Settlement in 1944 created the structure for the welfare state which followed. Nobody can say that that has been a failure. It's been a marvellous thing. OK. And I believe that the, the, all the parties should get together now and, and, and make the decisions about how much tax, how much investment, how, the role of the private sector, all these vexatious issues. All right, just, just uh, Maggie. I mean, it, it, it's interesting, here in, in Scotland, with a minority SNP government, yeah. parties do work together. The, the, gov the, the government has to in order to get anything through. And as Greens, we've been very, very clear that we want to see a pay rise for public sector workers and we want to protect public, serv public sector work services. And, and Kezia Dugdale herself said, if, if nurses and teachers get a pay rise in this coming Scottish budget, it'll be down to the Greens because we are working constructively right. with, a, with another political party. So, That's what so, politics should uh, be about. Just to, uh, we, we need to move on, but Michael Forsyth, just on that narrow, on what may not be a narrow point, but on that single point of a royal commission, the way Peter Obon was suggesting, do you think there's any future in that? Do you think, uh, I, despite I, the differences, I, I, that I could agree be agree with, with Peter because some of the things that will come out of it will be politically very unpopular. Like, for example, why should people who are perfectly able to pay get free prescriptions? Oh. 
when that money could be diverted into patient yeah. care. I mean, there are a whole... Uh, and, you know, this public versus private, actually, the government which did most to advance private was Tony Blair's government. And they did that in order to build the hospitals and schools. So we you need... You signed to... off on the PFI hospital in Edinburgh. You see what I mean? Uh, we, need, we need to actually be able to have a grown-up discussion. Should right. people have to pay if they don't turn up to their GP for their okay. appointment? Might there are a whole range your, of things that we could do. your attention, Mark, but the Labour Party is under new management. OK. It's going to go well, this Royal Commission, <laughs> I can see. Thank you for that. I'm, get, I'm, get, I'm, get, I'm going to move on. Just before I do... Uh... Um, let's, have this, let's have this question from um, Marion Thompson, please. Marion Thompson. What does the President's Club tell us about Britain today? What does the President's Club... You all know what the President's Club <laughs> is, I assume. The, the uh, uh, party at the Dorchester to raise funds for charity in which women were, um, according to the Financial Times, which sent an undercover reporter, were um, abused in various ways during the evening. What does it tell us about Britain today. Uh, Maggie Chapman, no, I think I get Fiona Hislop because we had you just last. Fiona, I'll come to you afterwards. Well, what we've seen on our, our screens, and I, I congratulate the FT journalists that uh, I think undertook a very brave uh, uh, exercise. Uh, I think the, uh, it's appalling. It's just absolutely appalling. So what does it say about Britain today? We're not as progressive as we think we are when it comes to the rights of women and how men want to use their power. <laughs> And yes, there are good and decent men that are in our society, but it's our society generally that still has that sexist, sexism. Um, and the, the idea you could have an institu institutionalised ticket price for licence for sexual harassment in this day and age is unbelievable. Now, in terms of, of, of what that means, I, I agree with Carolyn Fairbrother um, uh, from the uh, CBI Di Director General, because she made the point that this is symptomatic of how power and influence and networking happen more broadly, particularly in the city of London, but perhaps elsewhere in other areas. And if we really want a change, then these men, and they are men that are the, uh, the men that were that men only presence club, are the leaders of their businesses and sometimes our political life in other areas. And they are also responsible for our daughters, our sisters, our wives, and indeed our mothers as their employees. Now, we want women at the top, but we're going to have to get the change and the culture of how people respect women and a change in that balance. And I think that's what tells us, what the President's Club tells us. It's got to change. Okay. Women do not have to put up with this anymore. Let me say over there. You, sir. Um, so, how inappropriate was it then that the Minister for Children and Families was in attendance at the President's Club? Com completely mm. inappropriate. All right. I mean, quite, quite frankly, I think the whole thing is an utter disgrace. And for Theresa May to say, as she has done repeatedly over the last few months, that she supports equality, gender equality, and, and rights for, for women, to not turn around and then sack Nadine Zadawi for being at, at such an event, I think it shows just how little she really cares about genuine equality and that culture change that Fiona's been talking about. If we don't get really real leadership from our Prime Minister, then what, what on earth are we supposed to be telling our, our, our young people, our women and, and children all, all around us? If the Minister for Children and Families goes to a place where, where, you can, or where you are bidding for a lot to add spice to your wife, a, a cosmetic surgery for, for, for men to buy for their wives, I'm sorry, that is an utter disgrace right. and he has no place in the British government. Okay. Let me... Let me... Let me just, can I just repeat Marion's question? Because it wasn't just, what, what, was it wrong, the President's Club? It was, what does it tell us about Britain today? Peter Oborn. Well, I think what it tells us is that Britain is changing very fast. I mean, this deeply distasteful event uh, passed by without notice ten years ago, and suddenly there it is, and it stares at you, and it's completely horrible and unacceptable. That said, if I'd been Ormond Street Hospital and received, I think, was it 600,000 or something courtesy, I do, cannot for the life of me understand why they've given it back. If, you know, these, these, 
I... But, but also say something, I think it says something quite quite important about how our public services, Ormond Street Hospital and the NHS is funded. If it relies on charity donations from such dinners, what kind of a world uh, do we inhabit? There's a role. Actually, there is a role for charities in supporting great institutions and saving lives like the Ormond Street Hospital. And one of the saving graces of this ghastly event is that some money has gone to charity, 20 million we hear, and gone to the Ormond Street Hospital. And, and, and to uh, the we, Evelina... Hospital at St Thomas's in the other children's And hospital. have they given it back as well? They I say they're they going to give it back and any gifts now, they've had before. The one saving grace of this ghastliness is that it's, it's going to save lives. It would have saved lives. I cannot... I just... I think we have to... We need an explanation of why they're giving the money back. OK. You, sir. I would like to ask the lady calling for the resignation whether she feels responsible for my behaviour at this event. I think somebody who is, re is there representing, who, who is a representative of the British government, who, as, as Nadim Zadawi is, attending one of these events, I think that's a disgrace. He's not just there as an individual, he is there as a minister. The Minister for Children and Families, no less. For the Minister for, for Children and Families to be at an event where women are being groped, where women are being invited upstairs to men's bedrooms because they think that's fair game, they think that's appropriate. For women to be asked whether they are prostitutes is completely unacceptable. Right. I'm going to... <laughs> there, are, there, are only, there are only men with their hands up in the audience to speak for the moment, but maybe some women would like to speak. Let me come to Michael Forsyth. I'll come to you. Well, um, clearly, I mean, this was a revolting event and there were uh, a number of men behaving badly. But uh, Rita, I don't know what went on there from other than what I've read in the newspapers. But the minister has said that he went along thinking it was a charity event. Uh, he didn't see anything untoward happening. He felt uncomfortable and he went home. And I think really it's a bit childish to call for his resignation. I mean, he's condemned the event the event is being closed down. Uh, what does it say about our country, was the question. Mm. It just makes me feel sick to my stomach. It, what it says is that people are drinking too much and behaving very badly, and that there are still gross attitudes towards women, and that the behaviour of those men uh, is... It, at, at last, we have universal condemnation, and people have, uh, are getting the message that it's not acceptable. Um, it's Burns Night. I would just describe them as a parcel of rogues in a nation. OK. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Um, with regards to the charity giving the money back, there is such thing as dirty money. And uh, I think that the... the well, it says, thank you. And when it says, what does it mean about our society? It means that our society is, has got a, a misconstrued mo moral compass. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter. Sometimes money seems to talk for everyone. And I think to say that not to give them, for them to give the money back was wrong, I think it's absolutely spot on. OK. And, and the one up there, yes. Uh, I just think that with you saying that he's, he's left and he's, he's embarrassed about it, why didn't he say anything? He was there. I mean, I kind of think it's ridiculous to assume that he was there and he didn't see anything. What was he doing, walking around with his eyes, with his hands over his eyes? How many girls were at that party? And he, yeah, okay, he left embarrassed, but why didn't he, like, you know, blow the whistle? Why didn't he say something? Chris Williams. Well, I think what it says to me is that there are very rich, powerful people in this country who still think they have a sense of entitlement to abuse and exploit people at their whim. And Maggie made a really important point. <laughs> What kind of country do we want when a great institution like Great uh, Ormond Street Hospital is reliant upon charity from these types of individuals? And there's another point I want to make, which is really important, I think, and that it's this, that many of those very wealthy individuals attending that event will no doubt have employed smart accountants yeah. to avoid their taxes. Rather than actually avoiding their taxes, they should be grateful to pay their taxes to support our public services. And Clem Attlee summed it up beautifully. Let me just read a quote from it. It's a very short one. He said, Charity is a cold, grey, loveless thing. If a rich man wants to help the poor, he should pay his taxes gladly, not dole out money at a whim. And I think this thing at the present point okay. absolutely sums up everything that's wrong with this society at the moment. The woman up there. Yes, you. 
Um, I think it's just lad culture with very rich men who are able to pay for this type of thing. If anybody, any girls been to university, they're very clear of what this type of culture is and you're kind of just told to accept it. So it's just part of a bigger issue that we need to tackle as society, surely. Okay. We'll move on to another question. Peter Court, let's have your question. Is the Labour Party being taken over by momentum extremists? Well, Chris Williamson was a <laughs> Corbyn supporter and member of the Shadow Capital until a week ago, a couple of weeks ago. But I will come to you, Chris. But Peter Oban, what do you think? Is the Labour Party being, whatever taken over means, taken over? A majority of it being taken over by momentum? I, I think it's um, a little bit too uh, early to say. I think a lot of the reporting of this is hysterical. Um, and there's one area, at least where I'm rather in favour of momentum, uh, and that's in Haringey. You're reading everywhere about the horror of these mad people, these Marxist-Leninists seizing control in Haringey. Well, what's actually happening in Haringey, I have lots of friends there, is that this horrible private partnership, huge development, uh, invented by the Labour Blairite Council, bringing in billions of, uh, of private sector money, is wiping out huge areas of Haringey, destroying it ruining communities. And there's not, it's not just demented lefties who, who are against it. Loads of sensible people are against this thing which is going on in Haringey. Uh, and um, and I'm, so I'm, I just like to be a little bit suspicious of some of the things which I'm reading about momentum. OK. Fiona Hislop. Uh, the answer is I don't know. I don't know if Labour is being taken over by momentum. Um, I think it's more of potentially what's happening in England rather than necessarily what's happening in Scotland. Um, but I, I think in terms of where Labour is, I think people don't know where they stand on so many things. And I think that's the problem because I think a lot of young people, not in Scotland but in England, voted for the Labour Party thinking that they would stand up against what was happening in Brexit. Whereas Jeremy Corbyn is actually siding with the, the Conservative Party on so much of the Brexit issue. So I think that's, there's a, a great deal of, I think, smoke and mirrors. The fact that in Scotland, and I think in, in England, they say they don't want to tell people what their position is on what Peter and indeed Michael Forsyth has described as one of the biggest issues facing the country for a generation. Now, if you're aspiring to government, people have to know where you stand. Uh, and I think that's the difficulty people have with Labour just now. But it's their private grief. It's a different party. It's up for them to, to I think, to explain themselves. Uh, but I think right. people are confused as to what Labour stands for. But it's very dangerous if they're siding with the Conservatives on a number of issues while pretending to be in favour of the, of, of the working class and defending their interests. And sometimes I think we should be asking more probing questions. And I think that's something right. that our media could do far more of P as well. P Peter Court, what do you think? Well, it was set up after uh, Jeremy Corbyn was elected as leader of the Labour Party, and it seems to have been infiltrated by the far left, who are there to protect him from those who are against him within the Labour Party. I think the Labour Party has gone so far left, it's gone off the page. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, to me, is a Marxist. John, John McDonnell wouldn't deny that he was a Marxist when he was interviewed by Andrew Marr. And Diana, Diana, but I don't know where she is, but I wouldn't let her run a bath, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Chris Williamson. Well, look, momentum are not extremists, absolutely not. And if you look at the Labour Party now, it's an exercise in democracy. We are now a mass movement. The Labour Party has more members than all of the other parties put together by some distance. And when you say we're extremists, what is it that the Labour Party is putting forward now? Well, one of the things is we're opposing austerity, unlike the SNP, supported by the Greens, who are implementing austerity here in Scotland. No, no. But we actually are on the side of the British people. And if you look at the opinion polls, where the British people are at, well, the British people want to see the utilities brought back into public ownership. They want to see tuition fees scrapped. They want to see the economy working for ordinary people. They want to see investment in our National Health Service. They want to see investment in our in our schools, in our education. We want to give people a stake in our economy. We want to build the houses and that people need. where's the money need. coming for we this? We can create an Where's the money coming for this? How much is it going to cost to well, re-nationalise well, these industries? Well, it's a free ticket, essentially, sir, because they are revenue-generating bodies, aren't they? So any cost would be met 
by the revenue which was generated. But, for example, take the railways. I mean, what we've said with the, with the, uh, with the, with the train operating companies is that we would take them back into public ownership as the franchises come up for renewal. But, but it's not create... Labour Party policy, it's momentum that's yeah. interesting. And you, one of the things that you want and momentum wants is for candidates uh, to face mandatory selection, for instance, which is always used as a kind of code for changing the nature of the Labour Party. You're in favour of mandatory selection. Well, that's not momentum uh, policy, as I understand it, but uh, certainly I've spoken in favour of mandatory selection because if you think about it, there is no other elected position in this country which doesn't have to face a periodic endorsement. I mean, do you think members? half the Labour Party are on the wrong tack, the ones who oppose Corbyn? Well, you're they, talking they, about half the... La listen, I've been in the Labour Party... I'm talking about the MPs in, in West. Well, Western. yes, OK, but they're not, the la they're not the Labour Party, are they? They are a, the parliamentary Labour Party. They're an important part of the Labour Party, but the Labour Party Party comprises of getting off the 600,000 members. And when you take our registered supporters into account, right. we're talking about nearly 800,000 members. The Labour Party's never been more united, and we are on the side of the British people. We want an economy that works for everyone. No, 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 it's not about being far left. If you're talking about being far left, sir, we actually support uh, bringing the railways back into public ownership and the utilities. All right. You've said all that. I know, I'm, but, I'm but this is where because... the British people are at. That's what right. the British people want. All right. Um, um, and let me just repeat the question. Is the Labour Party being taken over by momentum extremists, was the word, uh, Michael Forsyth? Well, that's certainly their objective, which is why they want reselection. If I talk to my friends in the Labour Party at Westminster, who are, are reasonable, what I would describe as old-fashioned Labour people, uh, they are terrified at the prospects and they're under great uh, pressure. That is the objective. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, uh, Mr Macdonald are, in my view, very dangerous left-wingers who ruin this country and take us back to the 1970s. Um, uh, however, however I, would, I would just like to thank the Scottish Nationalist Party because twice like, in my lifetime, the Scottish Nationalist Party, That's because of I their policy more. on the Constitution, back in uh, the late 70s, they brought down a Labour government and made it possible for us to get Margaret Thatcher as oh, Prime Minister. That's rubbish. And at the last, rubbish. And at the last general election, by insisting on a second referendum, we they managed the to get 13 we Conservative the MPs, the 13 Conservative the MPs elected right. to Westminster, right. which saved us but from we the aren't Corbyn talking government. Funnily enough, the question... The question, I, I, the question I, I, is not about the SNP. The question is about <laughs> Labour and momentum and Maggie. Uh, well, ju just to pick up a couple of things that have been said, I think it was actually George Osborne who said he wanted to reduce public sector spending to 1930s levels. So, so I mean, the, the, the kind, that kind of austerity that we've experienced at the hand of the Tories doesn't bear thinking about. And I, I think... Many people support quite a lot of what Momentum and Jeremy Corbyn are trying to do, but to say that the Greens are propping up an austerity government in Scotland is just ludicrous. In Scotland, <laughs> last year, the Scottish Greens got the biggest ever concession out of a Scottish government in the budget process. We stopped £160 million worth of cuts in Scotland. Labour sat tax. by and did nothing. We put income tax up yeah, for the highest up, earners. The vast majority of people in Scotland will be less tax. Scotland right. will be the lowest taxed area of right. the UK we for normal to... people. We... <laughs> OK, we keep... I, I, I do understand why we keep sliding away from the Labour Party at Westminster and momentum into Scottish politics, but does anybody want to say a word about We're momentum in before we move <laughs> on? We are in Scotland. I had noticed that, funnily enough. And it's Burns Night, for that matter, so we're not... Yes, we're knowingly in Dumfries. You, sir, in the second row, and then I'm going to take another question. You, sir. Yeah, I'd like to ask the Labour MP, if your party is so big and so powerful and coming forward, how come the best you've got to offer is Jeremy Corbyn? Yes. In my, in, my, in my humble opinion, Jeremy Corbyn is the best leader that the Labour Party has ever produced and will be the greatest Prime Minister this country has ever seen. Because it will have a reforming agenda. It will have a reforming agenda that will make this country work for ordinary people, eradicate poverty and have an economy that actually gives people a stake in society and a decent future, decent pensions, decent public services. What is there not to like about that? I can remember... Um, so, John, sorry. Sorry, I can remember what it was like when the Labour Party left office in 2010. Debt, bills no paid, but the, and notes to say, good luck, Conservative, there's no money left. But, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, the Conservative... Uh, sorry. 
old, I'm old enough to remember what it was like when the public utilities in the 70s were in mostly Labour's hands. Strike after strike yeah. after Sorry, all out, yes. all out, and everything that intercity. You want to talk about trains? Intercity? Jeez, you've got a short memory, right. sir. You've got a short <laughs> memory. But the, the cassettes have doubled back. All right. I'll take one more point. Man up there at the back. Who's heard about? And then we go on. Yes. Utilities are actually state owned. The, the energy market is owned by the French government mainly. Yeah. The railways are owned by the, the, the Dutch and, and German government, and the Royal Mail is partly owned by the German government. So they are state owned, it's just not Great Britain who owns them. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, let's, uh, let's go on. Uh, David James, let's have your question, please. During Brexit, we will have a pro British US president. Isn't that tremendous? <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is in the light, presumably, of Donald Trump at Davos today saying there's going to be a tremendous increase in trade between Britain and America, and we, we love your country. Um, who would like to start on this? Peter Obama. Absolutely tremendous, actually. <laughs> I, I, I think that um, it's in the national interest that we should have excellent relations with the United States of America. They've long been our closest ally. They're going to be our trading ally. Uh, Mr... Trump, uh, there are massive issues about Mr. Trump. He's, he's a foul, he's a racist. Um, he's, um, he's, uh, and he's a danger, I think, in particular to the America more than to the world, actually. But it doesn't mean that Britain should not, ha not, not welcome him, which we're we hearing there's going to be a visit later this year. And I can't help noticing, when you re read the, the grand media, uh, panjandrums, they, and, and they, they You're say one of them, aren't you? Not, necess not, the, not quite. Not the grandest. And, um, yeah. and they, when Ma President Macron of France, he announces he is going to a state visit with uh, Trump, everybody says, isn't Macron marvellous? Isn't he superb? Isn't, that, isn't he brilliant at pursuing French national interests? But when it's suggested that Theresa May should do say the same thing with Trump, that's exactly the same people condemn her. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and do you think Trump is pro-British in the sense that it will help us with trade deals, despite Great the, the difficulties Great thing about Mr they've Trump, mm. all of his many faults, he's got a Scottish mother. Yeah. <laughs> and the significance of that? <laughs> I've got a Scottish <laughs> mother, it's pretty <laughs> significant, I can tell you. <laughs> Vienna is up. So do I. She's wonderful too. <laughs> the, the, this the... question is not about <laughs> Scottish mothers. <laughs> um, in t in t I, think, I think the serious point around this is what type of trade deal would President Trump want to have? Whether, and I share the real concerns about um, the racism and the concerns about his behaviour, uh, he's a protectionist president for the US. And the reality of it is, whatever he does will be whatever is in the interest of Donald Trump. And I think the idea that somehow Britain or MDLs else will have any preferential treatment uh, will be secondary, absolutely, to the protectionism of Donald Trump for, for his interests, um, and whatever they may be. The issue we have on trade, uh, and this is the real problem, is if it's a race to the bottom on whether it's workers' rights, regulations, or whether it's on our agriculture, our premium agriculture that we have in, if we have flooded US uh, produce that could ruin our agricultural sector, that is something that is a very serious implication, not just of our relationship with Donald Trump, but what type of deal would the UK try and pursue with Donald Trump, because they'll be desperate to get one, because it looks as if there's no prospect for all these wonderful free trade deals that are wanted to have. It just doesn't seem to be if that's going to be an option at all. Single market membership and customs union will protect our interests and will protect our agriculture and right. our economy as well. You, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, man here on the... On the... Surprisingly, I agree with Fiona there. I think Donald Trump would be bad for business. I'm thinking of Bombardier at the moment, where they're going to add extra <laughs> tariffs onto the wings that are being sent over. I think that's just the thin end of the wedge, and we'll, as you say, agriculture and things like that, they'll force... Uh, the type of food on that we do not really want in this country. All right, and the woman up there at the back. As an American citizen, I urge you, watch your backs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why so? Because I think Trump is a villain, and I think he will manipulate Britain into trade deals which they can't extricate themselves from, and Britain will be the loser. And, and David... Thank you. <laughs> David James, what do you think? I see Mr Trump as a fairly emotional person. Um, I think we have a great opportunity here because of his uh, Scottish and British connection. I think if we are friendly to him, he'll be a better friend to us than uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has been. <laughs> OK. Chris Williamson. Well, you know, I'm, I'm very suspicious, and I think wise words from our American friend at the back of the audience there. Uh, I remember uh, at his inauguration, uh, uh, Donald Trump saying, do you remember, America first, America first. We're in a parlous position, and this government is in a parlous position, a very weak position, if we think our salvation is negotiating a trade deal with the United States of America under Donald Trump. It would be a disaster for this country. And we need, in my view, to work more closely with our colleagues in Europe to ensure that we have access to the single market. <clears throat> that is the biggest market in the world. That's what we need to be doing. Uh, and rather than this nonsense of, of, of trying to uh, negotiate some sort of a deal with the Americans. <laughs> Michael Forsyth. Isn't it tremendous that we have a pro-British US president during Brexit, is the question. Actually, in the main, US presidents are pro-British. We have a very strong alliance with uh, the United States. We depend uh, on each other for security in Europe and the Western world. Um, but I think we need to look just beyond America. I mean, we... Uh, it's Burns Night, and um, his address to the Dumfries volunteers, do you remember it? Be Britain still, to Britain true among ourselves united, for never but with British hands will Britain's wrongs be righted. We don't need the President of the United States in order to survive as a country. When we've left the European Union, we'll be able to do business with the rest of the world. And just as Donald Trump wants to do his best for America, so we should do our best for Britain. That's my... <laughs> And Mag Maggie Chapman, for you. I, th I think some of the, the real danger of, of potential trade deals with, with America are, as, as Fiona says, a reduction in um, environmental standards, a reduction in, in human rights, in workers' rights, because, uh, as, as, as the, the woman at, at the back as well said earlier, Trump will negotiate in his interests and his interests alone. They are not going to be in the interests of workers here. They are not going to be in the interests of companies and, and providers and, and, and people who support the British economy. It's his bottom line that, that matters to him and that is it. And are you impressed by the accord there seemed to be between the Prime Minister and the President today at Davos? Does that... Does are, that your, are your me? withers wrung by that? No. No. OK. Does anything impress you? Not to impress <laughs> me. When it's right. worthy of being Let impressed Let me take a by couple it. more points. First up there, uh, on, the, on the far left there. Yes, woman there. In Scotland, we've already got our own two mini Trump trade deals. We've got two golf courses that uh, don't make any profits, that uh, have failed to deliver on the jobs that they were promised, yeah. and uh, that are actually claiming small business rates relief, so they're not contributing not at anymore. all. All right, not and anymore. you, sir, here, on the gangway here? Man in the white shirt. By the, by the time this government's got Brexit sorted out, Donald Trump will be long gone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> OK, all right, I'll just take a brief point from you, sir. Yes, then I want to move on. Yes. Do we really need to be uh, negotiating with a man who would have attended uh, a men-only uh, event <laughs> and also would allow it in one of his hotels? Okay. Right. I want to go on to this question from Robert Jardine, please. Robert Jardine, it's a question that we've had a, a, in a number of places from Question Time. We've never actually addressed it. Let's have your question, Robert. Should the closing of the bank branches not be more than a commercial decision, especially in a rural area like this? Bank, but banks... <laughs> we know that, that the closure of banks is causing real hardship and trouble to people. Uh, should it be more than a commercial decision? Should there be some intervention to stop it happening? Michael Forsyth, you're a banker. Then will you bank in that kind of banking world? Yeah, um... Am I allowed to do a show of hands? If I did a show of hands... No, you last... aren't. You know what happens yeah. to people who try and do a show of hands. <laughs> On this programme, they're well, If expelled. I had been allowed to do a show of hands, yes. I'd have asked people to say, 
uh, how many people had visited their branch in the last month. And maybe they haven't got a branch. Uh, uh, well, indeed, they, might, they, they do have a branch of their bank. And, and the fact is that increasingly we are not using bank branches. But having said that, in rural areas, just like post offices, the banks are really very important. And what we need to do is to try and get some arrangement where we can get services perhaps through a community shop or, or, or other and, and remove some of the rigidities that are between uh, services. That's the best I can offer. But you can't expect the banks to run uh, services which people are no longer using because and more people are online, more people are, they don't go to their bank as such. And I just think it's just, it would be great to have the past but it's just no longer possible because the world has changed. RBS are closing 259. Well, we had the RBS chairman here last week. We didn't get the question. You, sir, what do you think? Well, Person asked the question. Yes. I think the closing all these banks. If you take this area from basically Strandraer to Berwick, and you mentioned the Royal Bank of Scotland, I think there's only going to be either one or two in that area, the whole width of Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. The people that, that, that use those banks are probably not people that use online. Disabled, people who are out in the country who have no connection to online, uh, and I think you're taken away from the rural area. But, but could we not do something with the post offices? I mean, I know they're going well. Uh, Maggie, the Maggie, Cha offices. Maggie yeah. Chapman. I, I mean, th th there, there are a couple of issues in this, and, and, and I absolutely agree with you. Th th this is an example. RBS, which is actually a public bank at the moment, let's remember that. <laughs> RBS is being slimmed down so it can be flogged off uh, at uh, rock bottom prices to the private sector, just like Brit the, the British government did with Royal Mail. You, you remember, George Osborne's best man benefited from the sale of Royal Mail to the tune of several uh, tens of millions of pounds. That, that's, that's what I'm really, really concerned is, is happening here. And it's all Sorry, very well you've, to you've, say. You've lost me there. Jo what, what, I don't know what George Osborne's best man's got to do with it. We're talking about banks and. Yes. It's being slimmed down so it can be sold off. It, the, the, the public are currently the, the biggest owners of Royal Bank, yes. of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And do they want it to make a profit and, or not? And if, if, if it's do you want to see RBS down, make a profit or not? If it's being slimmed down like this, it's not going to be able to make a profit, see, and therefore right. it will be flogged off. And I think the, the, so the other thing, we're doing the, the other real, real concern that I have is branches that are being closed down, particularly in rural areas, it's all very well to say, you know, people are, are moving online. It's rural areas with the weakest broadband, with the slowest oh. internet connection. Oh. Where is the infrastructure oh. investment for that? Fiona Hislop. Well, in terms of the Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, they've already closed a, a good number of branches. Uh, I think the issues, people are moving on to online banking. Uh, but there are basic issues around what businesses can do, particularly in small yeah. areas, in, in rural areas, small uh, businesses reliant on regular deposits and what they can do there. But the important thing here is uh, they're not even doing it to save money. We've had evidence this week from the Royal Bank that they're not doing it to save money. So therefore, the question what was... What are they doing it for? Well, they're doing it because they're, they're trying to respond to customers who are, are moving more on digital. So therefore, the point of the question was, should it be, be more than a consideration of commercial banking? Well, if it was a 100% privately owned bank, that's one thing. But if there's a government majority in terms of the, the ownership of that bank, that's a completely different question. And that's why I think the, the interests of the rural economies in particular have to be borne in mind. And this idea that you can rely on the post office I had a Royal Bank closed in my constituency in Whitburn uh, just in October. They hadn't even spoken to the post office no, at the beginning right. of the process to make sure that, one, there was disabled access, that the post office could be trained in all this, uh, and if it's the last bank in town. Remember that promise, the last bank in right. town. So I think there is uh, a self-interest in ensuring that they can keep customers in rural areas. And, yes, it's important that we make sure that rural areas in particular are protected. I don't okay. think they've thought of that. You, sir. I, uh, I do use rural banks uh, in this area as much as I can, and uh, often I find that actually there's a queue. So the it's rural busy, banks yeah. are yeah. used quite extensively, and it seems really silly that uh, you know they would be removed from local uh, communities who really need as many services as they can get. Okay, and you sit up there. I think that the regulators need to be held account and be, um, you know, brought in more responsibly to, to try and hold the banks to account because clearly they're still conducting themselves however they see fit and, and self-interest. Peter Edmund. 
Yes, I can imagine a discussion going on in Dumfries in 1840. This the, the, the railways have turned up and there's a vigorous discussion about the need to keep horse and carriage businesses in operation. Uh, and the world is changing unbelievably fast. And that I think the answer is not to try and sort of get stay in a, in, in a, in a structure which has gone, uh, but to look for creative solutions. And OK. Well, and, and actually, Chris, may I just Britain, make a point no, on no, that? No, Chris, well, you're, I mean, you're that's, very well, brief. If you closing, the, closing the bank branches is not a creative solution, it seems to me. Look, the banks in this country seem to me to be behaving like corporate scroungers. It's not that long ago, is it, that they had their hand up for £350 billion pounds of public money. Surely it's time for them to put something back, isn't it, into yeah. the local okay. community. Okay. They, make, they make enough money... They make enough money... And they could quite easily provide this social service. It is required still. There are long queues, as the gentleman there has said. Let's keep the bank branches right. open. We have a minute left, a minute and a half left. I'll take a question from Doreen Reid, please, and I'll whiz round the panel with it. I don't know what they're going to say, but Doreen, you ask first. OK. In the current climate, does the panel think £500,000 per week salary is appropriate for a professional sports person? This was the footballer who, this week, I think, got... Yes? Signed Sanchez. up... Sanchez. What? Sanchez. Yes, and signed up for 500,000 a week for 52 weeks. Yeah, OK. Peter Oban. Yeah, isn't it a what a week? Jimmy Armfield, that great servant of English football, played for <laughs> England, £20 a week, and then uh, honest as the day is long, and then £600,000 a week. Uh, for being paid by... Uh, but it is the market, but it makes me very, very Man uneasy. Man Yeah. I should have had that Sanchez figure there. Sanchez has gone from Arsenal to Man U. He's being paid 650000 a week. It makes you feel a bit sick. When you consider that most of the people watching him play are probably on about twenty five grand a year, they earn less in a day, okay. less in an hour, than he does in a week. Right. Is it appropriate? Just round the table, because we've got to stop. No. <laughs> it's not appropriate. Is it appropriate? Uh, completely inappropriate. And many of these premiership clubs don't even pay the living wage to the, to the people who actually keep the club going. So, no, it's wrong. Is it the market or is it appropriate? <laughs> well, provided he's paying tax at 45% plus national insurance at uh, 12% <laughs> and employers' national insurance at 16%, yes, it is, because we need the money for the health service. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Very brief. Yes or no, Maggie? No. Absolutely not appropriate. We need a high pay commission because high pay actually drives inequality and because it's not taxed appropriately and that's what we need to change. Inequality is the biggest problem that we're facing at the moment and that's what we need to tackle. All right, thanks. <laughs> that's it, I'm afraid. That's it, I'm afraid. Time's up. Next Thursday for the rest of the evening. But here on this Burns night, we're all waiting to go and celebrate with the haggis and a wee dram. Uh, I'd thank the panel here and all of you who came to the programme tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Until next Thursday from Question Time, good night. <laughs>